Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Yes, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Tales of Tyria. This week, we'll be talking about a bit of news. Then we're jumping into our roundtable. Why Guild Wars 2 will fail. Finally, a bit of Skyrim talk from the team. Stay tuned, it's coming right up. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. You can check us out at talesoftyria.com. Now, I'm going to start right off by telling you we have a great show planned for you today, but it's a very different show, so don't skip ahead and skip all this important information right here because the roundtable is going to be, well, we're going to be lying to you uh, a little bit, and we're going to explain all of that. So stay tuned, don't skip anything, because it's you might get very confused. But let's start off by introducing ourselves. I am Bridger, I'll be your host for this evening, and joining me, as always, we have my plethora of co-hosts here around me. Let's start with the great power symbol himself, Gigawatt. Welcome to the show. Thank you, loyal servant. <laughs> 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 we'll all bow down to the amazing symbol of power. Why? And for those of you not watching live here tonight, every Sunday at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, you can catch us on the Tales of Tyria website, talesofteria.com. Gigawatts has still neglected to <laughs> get a webcam to see the, to, to, for us to view him. He it's, may be a vampire. That might be why. It's We're being not held sure. hostage at a UPS uh, distribution center over the weekend. Oh, those jerks. And it's a holiday coming up? Oh, you're never getting it. It's not coming. <laughs> It'll forever be a symbol be of him. power turned on its side like it's falling over. A fallen Ooh. symbol of power. <laughs> Speaking of that, we got great. <laughs> Welcome hey. to the show. <laughs> How's it going? I'm all right. Glad to be back after like the week hiatus. Yep, yep, yep. And still with the, uh, with the glasses glare. I can't do anything about that. We I gotta figure out a way to get a better angle. I just stream like that, like, hey guys. <laughs> we need to like have you higher or lower or like tilt the monitor back and forth or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Also joining us, Aku, away from school as well. Hey, hey, what's going on, guys? Not much. How's it going for you? Eh, it's doing all right. Thanksgiving soon. Can't wait to fill my my belly with some food. All right. Last but not least, freelancer, welcome. How's it going? Good to see Finally, you guys again. Uh, ventured outside uh, Skyrim for a little bit to join the podcast. <laughs> I know. You've been, you're at like 60 hours clock oh, already man. or something ridiculous. I am kind of almost there. But that's another story entirely. Let's move on to the news of the week. Uh, I'm going to post this link actually in the chat so you guys can follow along with these links if you would like. If I can find the chat. There's the chat. And it's not going to let me do that because I am not logged in. Awesome. All right, well, I'll figure that out in a second. Uh, what we've got here is three different news uh, links here. Guildmag.com, the Guild Magazine website, has come out with issue number eight. And I have to say, they put on a very impressive, uh, a very impressive suite of, of articles, I guess you could say. But they do more than just articles. They've got, they've got compendiums of videos, they've got audio, they've got interviews, they've got tons of stuff. Have you guys checked out this link that I put in there today? Yeah, I went through that, the, the Guild Mag. It was actually pretty good. They talked a lot about, uh, what was it, old? The Guild Wars 1? Yeah, they had, I mean, it's still a lot of Guild Wars 1 stuff, but they talked a lot about Guild Wars 1 and the lore and the stuff that goes from Guild Wars 1 to Guild Wars 2. The one that I liked a lot, they had a, um, a sort of a discussion on the catacombs that are under Ascalon, and they tied in how Guild Wars 1 dealt with the catacombs, which you only see at the very beginning of the game. Once you get past that first section of the searing, you never go back to the catacombs again, and the next time we see that is in Guild Wars 2, 
they're, they have actually released a trailer sort of showing you the opening cinematic of the dungeon that is based on the Ascalonian catacombs. So that, that's, they do sort of a compare and contrast and show you what it might look like based on what it looked like in Guild Wars 1. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it was cool. Like, they were trying to... Because we don't know anything about really the dungeons. Like, even the catacombs for Guild Wars 2, we don't know a lot about it. So they're trying to make, like, assumptions and stuff based off what we know from the current catacombs in Guild Wars. It was interesting. Yep. Anybody else check out anything? Uh, anybody see anything they uh, thought was cool in there? They've got a bunch of stuff this week. Um, the other one they talked about, the Destroyers, and the fight between the Dwarves and the, uh, the Destroyer, the Great Destroyer, and how... Uh, they had to turn themselves to stone, and there's this big, great, big story. Then there's a bunch of uh, some interviews and some cool music. They show uh, a bunch. Actually, one of them was awesome. It was the a, a link to the video of Play, the game, the video game orchestra doing the various themes from Guild Wars, be it the, be the original or all of the expansion's main themes. And I thought that was great. I listened to the whole thing. I thought I'd just check it out, and then I just sat there and listened to the whole six minutes without even leaving. So that was awesome. Um, there's some other discussions on Dwarven religion and some other stuff. Highly recommend you check it out because they have some very talented writers there and they, they know what they're doing. So that's, that's the first link for today. Next up is a video compendium for every single class. And this was really impressive. I noticed that, uh, I think I found this link on Reddit, where this is actually guildwars2journal.com. In their forum, if you go into the class section... One of their guys, I think it's just one guy, has gone through and put, or maybe it's a couple guys, put a link in every class forum called Video Compendium. So if you go on the Elementalist forum, there's an Elementalist Video Compendium. And they literally have about 20 or 30 links in here to all of the various videos of each class. So if you're looking for class-based videos to figure out, you know, what, what, how classes play and stuff in Guild Wars 2, if you're that itching to check it out, there are a lot of great links in here, and you don't have to go do a search on YouTube. They're all right here, by, organized by class. So definitely check that out if you're interested. It's on guildwars2journal.com, and the show notes will be on talesofteria.com as well in the uh, notes here. If you're watching it on the YouTube stream later on, you should see them there as well. Now, two other things I wanted to point out. I found two, while I was looking through lore stuff about Guild Wars and Guild Wars 2, I found two great maps of the world of Tyria that, uh, that are just fantastic. And these are probably the only maps you'll ever need if you're just trying to understand the geography of the game. Did you guys check these out? Can you guys yes, open these now and give me... <laughs> what did you guys no, think? No, I, I looked at them. They're pretty detailed. I like them. Yeah, one of them is actually like every single mission or quest hub or tiny thing in, in Guild Wars 1, and it's all done sort of in a very good style. I noticed with like that first one, they basically took the map that you had when you played the game, mm -hmm. and they assembled it all together. So like you get the whole like side of the world that you're on. Yeah, let me see if I can switch over to here so you guys can see it on the stream. This is, this is what it looks like. This is the one he's talking about. It's definitely the, the Guild Wars 2 map when it's all the way zoomed out. Um, and I believe, so this is where you do Guild Wars 1, and you go over the Shiver Peaks into Krita in Guild Wars 1 in the Prophecies, and then you come down to, is it Kantha or Lona first? I can't remember which one of these is the expansions. I think Kantha, I think it's Kantha is Kantha's. the first, Kantha's. and then Alona is yeah. the second. And Eye of the North comes back up to Ascalon in the Shiver Peaks and goes more into the Char homeland in the far Shiver Peaks areas here. So that, uh, that's, a, that's a very cool map. This other one is fantastic detail. And it's very well done. It's easy to see everything that's here. There's different symbols. It's got a key. It's, it's fantastic. So if you are looking for some sort of guide to help you learn the lore, like I always find that when they're describing different areas and wars that took place, I want a visual reference. And it's nice to have these kind of maps. So that is, I think, it. Anybody else have any news for this week? I mean, it's been a kind of a dry spell. It has, unfortunately. I'm just waiting, I'm waiting to hear like either beta or new class. It's gonna come out on like a random day, and everyone's just gonna freak out. It'll probably somebody actually. I saw. I can't remember where it was. Was it PVP Guild Wars 2 PVP? I was checking a bunch of news sites today. One of them had a uh, a suggestion as to when we will see information, and it was based on the release of a lot of the other classes. 
It said that they got released early in the week to allow for the news cycle to perpetuate through the whole week. And, you know, they don't want to release it too late in December because the Old Republic is coming out and it's going to steal a lot of the thunder. But they should wait another week or so for Skyrim slash Modern Warfare 3 news to die out. And so they basically nailed in on the tu- the Tuesday or Wednesday after Thanksgiving is when they think it's going to happen, that they're going to be some kind of announcement. And then maybe the week after that, we'll see more announcements about beta or something like that. Yeah, of course you had uh, J-Star happen over the last week, and um, that was really good. I don't that's true. Guys... I, thought that, I thought that was uh, – I think that's, that's since – it was. It, we covered some of that on the last show, I believe. But we did have. Uh, well, I wasn't on your last show. <laughs> yeah, you weren't. Did you have any thoughts from stuff that you saw in there? Um, well, I mean, I was just wanted to note. I mean, for the first time ever, I don't know if you guys covered this, but um, you know, Arena Net, their team got beat, which is. Oh, uh, I didn't always, see that. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of any of the. Big well, they were in Korea, guilds, but so <laughs> like you had War Machine and Evil, uh, a couple members from both of them. Um, got together and formed their team against Arena Net, and uh, it was a really, really good game. There's a bunch of videos on YouTube. I'm sure I can give you some links, and you can post it on the podcast notes. But um, sure. it was uh, very, very good matches. I, I quite enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, any final news before we move on? Anybody got any interesting things to say? All right, consider them done. Let's move on to the next part of our show, I like to call it a bridger rant. That's right. Because when I get upset, when I get angry, I got to vent. And when I vent, it's called a bridger rant. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been looking all over the place for other Guild Wars 2 podcasts because, you know, I enjoy podcasts. I like listening to podcasts. I listen to them in the road. I listen to them at work. I listen to them on the gym. I got Audible. I listen to them a lot of times. I'm a talk radio kind of guy. And I love listening to podcasts about things that I'm interested in. So I'm always looking for some kind of Guild Wars 2 stuff. And I find new stuff, and it says Guild Wars 2 Podcast. And I look around, and I see I see a YouTube link, or I see an audio link, but where's the RSS feed? And I say, I must be stupid. I can't find the RSS feed for this podcast. And somebody says, there's no RSS feed. Or what's an RSS feed? That's a podcast, you idiot! You can't have a podcast without an RSS feed. If you don't have an RSS feed... It's not a podcast. It's just a YouTube video show. All right? RSS is what makes podcasting podcasting. It's what allows me to just go to my phone and go, hey, there's a new episode of this. And there's been at least two or three of these Guild Wars 2 podcasts that are not actually podcasts, and it's blowing my mind because I want to listen to them. I want to be able to see them, and they're audio shows. I just want to be able to get them on my freaking phone so that I can just be there, boom, and they're done. I don't have to download anything. I don't have to go to a website. I'm driving. I can't go to a website when I'm driving. It just doesn't work. Cuts frown on that kind of a thing. Now, that having been said, I will point out that there are two podcasts that I do recommend if you're looking for other Guild Wars podcasts. The ones that I listen to, first and foremost, is Guild Wars Insider. GuildWarsInsider.com does a fantastic job. I really admire the host of that show. Seven does a fantastic job. He's got a great voice. He keeps it on topic. He keeps it paced. It's very well done. The other one that I was listening to recently is less consistent than Guild Wars Insider, but it also has some very good content and, and some very well-spoken people on there, and that's Guild Wars... Uh, is it Guild Mag Cast? Guild Wars Cast.com, I think. Uh, I'll put the link in the show notes. Those two are the ones that I recommend. But for God's sakes, if you're going to call it a podcast, make sure your RSS is working. I did. And if I can do it, you can do it. All right. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Someone's going home sore. I got a vent. I was blown away. <laughs> I didn't even have to find the RSS. Those two have been in iTunes for so long, I just did a search on Podcaster and found them. That's how, that's how awesome those guys are. The Guild Wars 2, or the Guild Wars Insider and the Guild Wars Cast... Com. It's the Guild Magazine website or whatever. Anyway, let's I, I move sense on. a lot of personal <laughs> frustration there. I, I want to <laughs> listen to stuff, and I can't because it's not there. Is it really that hard to like set it up, though? I'm just, I'm just asking. No, set up RSS? Yeah. Uh, well, if you haven't done it before, it is a bit of a learning curve. Um, several places will help do it for you. There's a great, actually, if you are looking to do your own podcast and compete with us, there is a great um, <laughs> WordPress plugin that's called PodPress. I used that for a long time uh, when I was doing Tales of Heroes, and it oh, it's, it was beautiful. 
I don't know if it's still around or if it's still good, but, uh, but it's great. Um, so, I guess we should move on then to the round table. Why Guild Wars 2 will fail. Now, this is a very interesting section, so let me explain what we're going to do here. Each of us is going to take a turn, or several turns, we'll see how many times we have to go around, um, playing Devil's Advocate. And basically, making a claim about Guild Wars 2 will fail for this reason. And then, they will continue to defend that reason against the rest of us on the show, and we will essentially be trying to... Uh, whoever's not playing the devil's advocate is going to be expressing their true feelings. So maybe they'll wind up agreeing with someone and say, yes, I think that actually is a gimmick. And they might join his side if that's their actual truth. But just know that the devil's advocate, the person that's putting forth the claim to begin with, probably doesn't mean what they're saying, and they're just playing devil's advocate for the purposes of the discussion. So, who wants to go first? I think Freelancer wants to go first. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Why Guild Wars 2 will fail? Is that the, is that the question? That's the question. Uh, lack of competitive support. And uh, we went over this a few episodes back. You remember how we talked about, um, you know, the no, they haven't really officially launched an observer mode. They haven't officially launched a uh, any of the spectator tools, anything like that. Um, it wouldn't be so much a problem, except that they are touting this to be the next big competitive, you know, MMO slash game, and uh, they have nothing to back it up with. And I'm worried that they will not release these tools on day one. And I will argue with you guys to the end of time, saying that it has to be on day one. I don't care if they're broken tools. I don't care if they're rudimentary. If they're not all the way, however you want to word it, that's fine. But there's got to be some form of as a caster, if I were a caster, or we'll take uh, some of the great casters out there, let's say Total Biscuit or DJ Wheat, they want to put their support behind Guild Wars 2 in the, um, in the competitive scene. they got to have a means of doing that like they can in, um, in any of the other games they do now, like StarCraft, etc. Uh, even games like League of Legends and such have so many tools now to cast games and to support the tournament scene. It's, it's kind of like you have to do that now. And uh, not only do you have to do it, but it's, you know, it's just common sense. If you're going to support that competitive scene, you've got to give the tools out there for the guys that are actually doing the supporting for you. Counter opinions. <laughs> well, uh, if, I, if I'll jump in here. I mean, you mentioned League of Legends, and League of Legends, from what I'm aware of, didn't actually have replays in it forever. And actually, like, good, like, first person, you know, f first and party, like, replays. Yeah, and, well, it sucked because people couldn't watch replays, but there was still, like, a, a scene there, but we don't see it exploding like it is now until they actually do now have that replay system in and that they're, they've worked on their, like, UI and they've worked on, like, their viewer stuff. So having it in, having it in or not in is, I think it can delay it. I don't think it will kill it. I don't think it will kill it either, but you have the factor that you got Star Wars, coming out um it's going to be competing with two very big mmos that everybody's going to be talking about one is obviously like I said star wars and secondly is you got uh i don't know what they want to call it nowadays uh the the new blizzard mmo that they <laughs> that they are uh, touting titanic but titan titan, titan. <laughs> titanic because it's gonna fail i'll never let go blizzard i'll never let go I mean, we'll we'll call it uh, yeah, we'll call it Titanic, and um, <laughs> you know, all the fanboys are going to be talking all about that game. Project um, Panda. Of course, you got Star Wars. All of the, I'm not going to call them fanboys because being a Star Wars fan is a legitimate thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, no other yeah. fan is legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you have a, a there's a difference between a World of Warcraft fanboy and a Star Wars fanboy, and there's a very finite line there that you have to uh, <laughs> uh, define, but uh, I don't know. It's Guild Wars 2 is going to have for all the people that are looking at it, especially your, we mentioned War Machine and Evil and, and all of the other competitive teams coming out there, my own guild, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you got to have um, the support besides just saying here, here here's two groups of uh, well, you could set up your own games. You can run, theoretically, your own servers to whatever 
specifications you want. We're giving you all the tools to play the game how you want. Well, that's all fine and dandy. I could do that in, in any game. I mean, where is the competitive aspect of that? Where can I, if I want to show this game to 10,000 people at a time, how do I do that? If I, if I were to ask an uh, ArenaNet employee right now that, okay, you're, you're giving me the tools to set up a tournament, but I want this tournament to be successful, and that includes, one, getting the revenue, which comes from spectators, two, advertising, it, it just, the list goes on and on and on. How do I do that? If I want to show this to your entire staff, ArenaNet, how do I show off my tournament right now? And they, as of right now, they have nothing to say that, oh, we'll have a replay system, or, or hey, we'll have a, uh, and I could be wrong, if any of this was changed, chew me out in chat. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, oh, we'll, we'll have this system, or we'll have this is. But right now, they're, they're pushing all this competitive stuff, and they don't have anything to show for it. And if they don't have anything, um, even come, even just a glimpse of information come beta, it's that is why Guild Wars 2 will fail on the competitive front. All right, Gigawatt, any response? Uh, I, I kind of take the. This, there are other things you could do to support esports, just like making it a balanced and competitive environment and building a place where people can get into it, and then bringing those tools in later, like with an expansion, with a big marketing push. I think that's what's important. As I've said before, it's not necessarily the on-release buzz, but there has to be buzz. And I think it will be better if it's on-release, but I also don't think it's going to kill it. I, I agree with Luke on that. Aku, your thoughts? Uh, I actually agree with um, what Gigawatt just said. Um, I don't necessarily believe that it'll kill the PvP scene outright if it's not there on-release, but... You know, if they get the tools out there, you know, a couple weeks, maybe a month out there, then great. Um, any longer than that, then we might be pushing that envelope to uh, PvP death, <laughs> so to speak. I tend, well, go ahead. I tend to agree with what Freelancer says on, on the whole, but I also remember a time before cash tournaments, before casters, where we had a pretty strong competitive scene. I mean, I played TFC. We played Tribes 2. Way back in the day, we didn't need all this stuff. We still had a very strong competitive side. We still had a very strong competitive... People would organize tournaments. The tournament organizers would work with the players. The teams would have strategy meetings. They'd, they'd practice every night. I was part of a top 20 TFC meeting, you know, clan, and we didn't need any of that. So I think it's still absolutely possible that even if it didn't have you know, all of this stuff, that you would still have a competitive scene. I do agree, however, that if you want to have a competitive scene to rival that of League of Legends or StarCraft II, you need all this stuff on launch. I guess we can all, kind of, or, or, or shortly thereafter. However, I think not having it on launch and instead having it af shortly thereafter is better than having buggy tools and cameras that, that break something. That's absolutely I guess, the case. I guess the problem is, um, you know, when I use the word competitive, let's let's ditch that word a second. Let's use the word uh, professional or esports. Um, I hate the word esports. I really do. I loathe it. But um, it's, you know, when we start talking, and they mentioned it, not just, you know, you, not, you don't just hear it from community members. They mentioned they want to help develop an esports scene and et cetera, et cetera. Esports is something beyond what TFC was. Could go to uh, any public venue, the, any internet cafe, and mentioned, have you heard of the the TFC competitive scene or a professional scene? Or I mean, if you name any um, competitive game, well, competitive being used loosely there, uh, it's always the ones that people know, the ones that people watch, the ones that fill up Twitch TV here, the ones that fill up uh, Own 3D, all the other streaming programs, is not TFC. Why is that? Because there's no way to broadcast TFC. So therefore, yes, there is a competitive scene. I can get with a bunch of friends and we can pretend we're good and we can face other teams that pretend they're good. But when it comes down to money, people being paid for doing this, um, when it comes down to sponsorships and, and tournaments, etc., it will never get off the ground because there, there's just the money's not there and, and the money is so closely interlaced with the spectator and the viewership. So um, that's why TFC, if you 
if you uh, half the people in this stream right now probably don't even know what TFC is just for that reason. Uh, oh, that's because it was a niche back then. It was a niche. <laughs> but but I, I, I see where you're coming from. Uh, however, CyberSpark in the chat brings up a good point in that for the first month or so, there's going to be a lot of people just figuring stuff out. I mean, it's a very complicated game. Just learning one class is going to take a while to study and memorize all of the different uh, things that it can do. And maybe we can learn some of those things ahead of time. But getting used to when the timing and how long each cooldown is and, and getting a feel for that is going to take at least a little while before we can get some really interesting strategies and in-depth stuff going on. And uh, to some extent, you know, if the tools came out a month after, it wouldn't be that bad for that reason. But uh, I agree... With, with what everybody said. I mean, we're kind of rehashing the argument that we had before that, you know, a marketing push could help. But I agree that would be great to, to have that focus brought on it. Let's move on to, uh, to another one uh, here. Does anybody want to jump in or I can go? Aku, you got one? After your rant there, Bridger, I'm kind of scared. <laughs> Who wants to say anything? They're all afraid. <laughs> None for Don't me, be sir. afraid. There's no way for me to drive over to your house and murder you in your sleep. Because you live in Connecticut right nearby. All right, let me go. <laughs> let me go next. Here we go. <clears throat> Guild Wars 2 will fail because it's trying to say there's this holy trinity is dead. They've murdered it. It's gone. It will never be back. But in the end, it's not dead. They've just brought it to a different form. People are just going to use the Guardian as their tank. People are just going to pick whatever class has the highest DPS because that's still all that matters. In a game where you're trying to kill things, you've either got DPS, you've got control, and you've got things that can take damage. And that's all there is. It doesn't matter. You can So if you tweak every class to do as much damage as possible, figure out which class does the most damage, people are going to figure it out. They're going to do tests. They're going to lab it. And then... We're just going to have the Holy Trinity back again. It doesn't matter if you don't emphasize it. Um, can I go off? Go You're not going to kill me, right? No. Okay. Probably. <laughs> just to make sure before I'll I say I'll mute anything. myself so that... <laughs> uh, to kind of get over that is, like, I think the fact that you're going to have limited abilities and it's going to rely a lot more on sort of how you set yourself up beforehand and it's not just going to be like oh at this moment I need to use this because you know you may not need that or you may not have that and it depends on how big the theory crafting community takes hold in Guild Wars I for one hope not it doesn't take like that big I, I'm pretty sure there's going to be like standard stuff but then I don't want to see standard stuff because I want to have people see, be like creative and try different stuff at the same time I don't know. but uh, based on that actually I believe that well, I'm a huge theory crafter, Luke, uh, excuse me, you know this better than probably anyone here. Uh, I love my spreadsheets. So um, <laughs> I, I usually, if, if the community is, you know, saying that such and such move or such and such abilities are the standard, are the best moves, I actually kind of believe that through that theory crafting, you're going to have these group of people or one person or a couple of people actually saying, hmm, if I use this instead of that, that actually might do something better or, or or worse for that for that matter, which would bring that creativity that you're ask, what you're actually asking for. So, um, in that sense, I, I, I guess the the Holy Trinity is kind of placed on the player as opposed to the game itself. If you want to play your guardian as a tank, you're more than welcome to, but you can also play that guardian as a, a ranged DPS or a support. So. But doesn't it still come down to math in the end? If yep. one class has a set of abilities that, when triggered in a certain order, do more damage in a certain amount of time than any other class, isn't that class going to be the one that everybody takes to try to use for a DPS role? If you can hit me, I mean, there's a dodge mechanic. you got to land all of those first. <laughs> See, it's, it's like, I don't think theory crafting actually promotes creativity. I think it promotes more, like, this is what we need to do, and this is how we do it. And I agree, like, numbers are very, like unmoving they're very solid so numbers will make you do things and once if they get their like number hands on it it's not moving it's gonna there's gonna be like the standard build for ranger and there's gonna be a standard build for guardian and i just hope that doesn't happen and that would actually kill this game yeah right. see that's that's 90 percent of players that they're gonna search on game FAQs, one of the, you know, old sites, or they're going to search on uh, any of the big Guild Wars sites. They're going to go to Google. And this is, 
Yeah, this is literally nine out of ten people that play WoW, and most likely the same people. relative people that play <laughs> Guild Wars Two. They're gonna go to Google and they're gonna type, "What is the best Guardian build?" And <laughs> and you know it's gonna happen like that. Yeah, that's it is. How... Google never lies. And Will from Alpha gonna... will calculate it for you. <laughs> and to counter that that point, Bridger. Uh, the, what they're going to find in Guild Wars 2, if they do it right, and so far they are, is that they will, well, the, what they will find is nothing but opinions. And instead of hard facts, they'll find, well, this is what I think is the best build. I think my elementalist best build is the kind that goes all melee and owns people in their faces. And that's fine, because that's what my opinion is. But there's there's so many skills and so many builds and so many available ways to set up your character. I don't think that the trinity will matter i don't think that um any of that will matter because there's just so much choice you know you might have a guardian bill that seems to work for one guy but there's so many choices that you won't find those you know those wiki builds therefore you won't have the standard tank and stuff like that and it should be mentioned that the guardian if i remember correctly is Probably the worst uh, metaphor for a tank because he's not actually built with a high health uh, pool or anything like that. Yeah, I think so, I remember that. Yeah, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's going to be one of those things. I think that you know, Arena Net has said multiple times, if you're an elementalist and you need to tank, you can jump in there and tank uh, at it quickly or just as much as any other class, and. I think players, they're going to take some getting used to. I think people are going to roll an Elementalist, for example, thinking they're going to be a hardcore nuker. But what they're going to find out very quickly, just between levels 1 to 5, is that, wow, the, these melee-oriented skills or these close-range skills are actually pretty cool, too. And then that whole barrier will be shattered. Mm -hmm. What I, what I uh, let's, let's see, Gigawatt, what do you think about the Holy Trinity? Is it actually shattered? <laughs> I think we're going to see it in different groups. I think it is going to be an opinion thing, and it's just a product of good design. I, from everything I've seen from ArenaNet, they're doing everything right and making and executing an easy-to-learn, hard-to-master system better than I've ever seen in an MMO. And I'm the layered choice where you have a certain amount of choices at this level, like what weapon you're going to use, and then you have a whole new set of choices in your traits, and you have a whole new set of choices in cross-profession combos. It's all layered, but no one layer is, I feel, is too complicated. It's where people can start to pick it up. But as you start to learn all the synergies, it really begins to pick up in complexity and gets to what can be a really competitive and fun game. So I think that some people are going to want to run this deal, and maybe this like X Guild is going to have there are perfect builds that everybody has to go, but there'll be other guilds that are doing the same encounters without um, doing what is quote-unquote considered the optimal build because there's going to be so many viable options. I think they're just building and designing it and balancing it really well from what I've seen. All right. To be fair, as far as my actual opinion on the subject, I think it's going to be difficult to say specifically because of all the different things that you can play and because classes can switch it up. They can go from one style to another just by switching a weapon. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how all the classes work together towards a goal without being locked into specific roles. I hope that that, because it's not tied directly into there, really comes out as a you can quickly switch to whatever is needed in the group, or you have the weapon selected so that you can switch between two different roles, and you know you're, you're, you you organize this five-man team so that you and this guy Fred, you guys are DPS slash you know tank guys, and these guys over here are going to be be able to switch between these two roles, and then maybe in the next game you can play different things based on how you build your character. So I'm hoping that uh, we see something like that. But I think. A lot of players are going to, at the very beginning, try to build their characters in specific, to fit specific roles. And they're going to, how, many, how, many, how long is it going to be before somebody gets to level 30 and says, need a tank for the first dungeon? Like, you know that's <laughs> happening. No, and think about, like, what Guild Wars 2 is. It's an MMO. And in MMO, we have, his, like, historically had these ideas that people have to play roles. And people are going to want to play roles. They're going to be like, I want to be the mage nuker, or I want to be the rogue sneaky sneaky DPS, or I want to be the tank. It's going to happen. 
hands down. Well, why is that, right. though? Why do people want to play roles? Because in every game going back forever, what they've done is reward specialization. Because when you, when you stack bonuses in a particular way in RPGs, it really sets you in one particular path. And I think that's probably the reason that people expect roles to be important, especially in a group environment. You need to have roles in order to make sure everybody understands what they're doing. Because if somebody's job is simply to, you know, work with the group and make sure that you keep bouncing back and forth and taking damage and then not taking damage, that's not a very specific instruction. So you can't just tell somebody you're a tank and have them understand what that means. There's a lot more complexity there, which I hope will add to the experience. But we'll have to see. All right. Do you have any over there uh, great to propose for us? Any doom sayings? Well, I have one, actually, and it's kind of spawned off of discussion of, uh, of what we've brought up, the idea that the end game might not be, like, infinite, as MMOs are right now. And, uh, and some, like, discussions with, like, people that have listened to us, they've been saying, like, well, if the game doesn't end, then nobody's going to play. And if there's a bit good, like, uh, argument that a friend you mean of mine the game, saying, if the game like, does end, yeah, then nobody's going to play Nobody's going to want to play it if they can't play it forever. Because the biggest thing is, like, you get to play every day or every week with your friends and do the, do the raid or dungeon. And if this doesn't have any type of, like, larger, I want to say large-scale endgame to it, it's going to fail right away. Um, yeah, we, we covered that a lot, but I have to say, I... I think they're the end game for me, and for probably a lot of people, is PvP. I've never mm -hmm. felt like any kind of AI has ever been a challenge because AI is by definition right now scripted to act in a certain way based on input. So if you do this, the AI will do that. That's just how computers work. If this, then that. That's how they work. Once we have programmed AI that can learn from its mistakes and learn from what other players are doing, then it might be interesting to play over and over again. But for me, I've got to play another human. I've got to play somebody else who's unpredictable. Because they could do anything. Their experience may have taught them that this is viable. And maybe because I'm not expecting that, it's viable. Even though it's not necessarily viable under any other circumstance. You've got to prepare for everything. So for me, that's always been the end game. And I know there's a lot of people that played Guild Wars because it had a huge PvP community. And that was the end game for a lot of them. I think the end game PvE, uh, PvP, whatever you want to call it, the, what's going to break up the... the the fact that you feel like you've done every quest and every raid in the game is the world versus world. Um, I, I don't think that was mentioned. Um, it's that is your end game PVE. I, I don't care what kind of epic dragon you've taken down or any new dragon coming out. It's still just a dragon. You're going to have the same set of goals. You're going to have the same set of ways to take it down. It's always going to be static. And and I know they're promoting the idea that you'll have different ways to do it or you'll have different sub quests in order to beat the big boss but it still comes down to a set you know it's still all static I, I don't care how you sugarcoat it what will be dynamic is the the sense of glory the sense of pvp in a large scale pve environment meaning keeps raids you know and um and everything that is, is entails with that uh it's that is your end game PVE, and I think if they fix the issues that think games like Warhammer had, uh, that made it so redundant, um, and they really go into the whole server versus server concept, you know, where there's uh, leaderboards and servers can claim glory over other servers, and when uh, when you're stacked up against this particular server, all of a sudden your entire server, all the PVE characters or PVP. Um, you know, get together and they get on their PVE characters and they're like, we got to go out there and, you know, and, and take uh, victory. And, and that has nothing to do with the hard line PVE stuff. And I think that will be your end game right there. Well, I mean, the, the person I was having these conversations with, he would say that he doesn't want to do any PVP. He doesn't really like PVP, but he wants, you know, he, he's going to try out Guild Wars too. But he doesn't feel that it'll be a game that he'll stay with, and probably. I never he'll... understand people that don't want to play PvP. I feel it's... like they don't want to challenge themselves, because that's the only time I feel challenges when I'm fighting other players. I feel like I should go on a rant here, because I don't understand it. Why don't you want to play against other people? Because they don't want to feel like they're beaten by other people. They don't want to lose. That's the big problem, I think. I'm gonna go it's out there the... and say it. I'm gonna say it. They're just scared. 
It's, <laughs> a, fear, it's a fear of loss. Uh, take a StarCraft Two, for example. Uh, in my own guild, I have easily, you know, a ton of StarCraft Two players that will play custom games, right? Well, you know, where you play against other players, but nothing is ranked and nothing is uh, really looked up or down upon. And then you have players that are so hardcore playing PV, you know, uh, or league games that. Um, it, it's a very different group. But what makes those two people different? What makes the person that wants to play dodgeball with other people and then wants to play dodgeball against the wall? It's <laughs> it's the it's the social aspect. It's the fear of having people judge you. It's the ha it's the fear of people, um, you know, rating you on your accomplishments. Uh, it, this is such a cutthroat world in PvP. If you take a look at uh, in guilds and WoW um, that do PvP arena teams, um, if you do any looking into uh, anything regards to PvP or league games, there's a very defined line between somebody that is accomplished and then somebody that is spat on because he's trying to be accomplished. And so getting into those first games and knowing that you might lose is such a big barrier for people. And I think we should talk about that some other time, but... Uh, that's your issue with. That. I have a whole episode planned on playing to win. That's that's that's. I want to. I want to <laughs> wait until we have more information about the mechanics to give really good examples about that. But if you haven't checked out David Serlin's website, Serlin.net, and the playing to win articles he has on there, fantastic. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, and this book right here. <laughs> oh, coincidental. I'm doing <laughs> research placement. for. I'm, yeah, I'm doing. Well, this is actually. You can read the whole thing for free on his website. Um, oh. But uh, you know, he asked for a donation if you like it. But uh, I'm I'm doing research for an article I'm going to write on the Team Legacy Network. Actually, uh, TeamLegacy.net, by the way, best guild ever so far, because we can't prove it yet. <laughs> but we will. <laughs> we will. Uh, all right. So let's see. Uh, let's. Did we get everybody here? Gigawatt. Did you have one? I think off the top of my head, we kind of discussed some of my ideas already. So. All right. Let's see. I've got one here. I yeah, think... haven't gone yet. Oh, that's right. I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I forgot we skipped you. All right. Well, I kind of have t – uh, well, as of right now, Guild Wars 2 is currently failing because it's not on my computer. I'm just, I'm just putting that <laughs> out there right now. Um, uh, and, um, well, I would say that Guild Wars, Guild Wars 2 will fail because of the fact that it isn't on a subscription-to-play uh, basis. So based on that – um, they actually might be thinking of a play-to-win cash shop as play-to-win cash shop as uh, many free-to-play titles have actually come out with. Um, and coming from this uh, coming from this standpoint, that absolutely terrifies me. Um, considering that I don't like the fact that just because someone has the I guess wallet or the coin purse to uh, put down that they should be able to literally stomp my face into the ground and considering that this considering that this game doesn't have a subscription that might be another way to generate some revenue so but but that's how america works if you have money you get what you want <laughs> isn't that meritocracy i thought that's what it was yeah i i certainly think if there are any pay to win items in the cash shop i will be livid and there are ton of other people that would be livid too. One of the reasons we were talking about this before the show, one of the reasons that League of Legends is doing so well is because it doesn't have any pay to win products in the cash shop. Everything in the cash shop is uh, basically voluntary. It's not something that is required in order to win for the most part. I mean, I'm perfectly fine if a person wants to have a pink unicorn following them around. I'm perfectly fine with that. No, it you know, breaks my it, it, immersion. It, it, I don't want any pink unicorns or engineers. This is no, a no, fantasy no. universe. I'm sorry. It's like it's like this, but you know, if you have that pink unicorn, then that means you are awesome at the game, and that you can beat everybody that goes up against you, right? That's well, how that about works. the pink unicorn? Like, I'm gonna relate to pink what unicorn. Pink unicorn? Did we just make That's... up a pink unicorn, or is this something I'm not knowing about? I hope it's made up. I'm really, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to relate that to the spectral mountain fucking wow or whatever. Oh my god, I it, hated that thing. It has wings, but it doesn't fly. Every time I, thought, I see it, I'm like, how could that guy get a flying mount at level 20? Sorry. Everyone <laughs> got that mount who actually spent the $25 on the mount was harassed in game and like not invited to raids and stuff just because they had that mount. <laughs> it Sorry, became a way to discriminate against players. 
I'm gonna have to go on like a freelancer rant one of these episodes. Whoa. Uh, I'm gonna have to go on a freelancer rant one of these episodes about one how much cosmetic items don't matter and we don't give a flip, <laughs> and two <laughs> how much I hate you know just guilds and players and everybody out there that thinks that. Because I was the top guild or the top player in WoW, that I'm going to be the best in Guild Wars 2. I cannot stand that. Oh my... Okay, we're going to leave it there. Yeah, <laughs> <Pink Unicorn. laughs> It's Freelancer rant incoming. Yeah, we'll I, I could go on from the tangent like about that. Because you, you, <laughs> you know those players. You guys know who I'm talking about. The guy that has the spectral mount or the spectral tiger. Or the, the armored war bear from WoW, meaning you know he did all those achievements. I don't care. That doesn't make you... <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, you have no life and you spent, you know, 40 hours a week getting that. But Hang on. But you still doesn't make you a skilled player. It drives me I insane have, and I, I see that every your, day. I have you science, backed up by science, Freelancer. This is science backing you up. It works, bitches. Have you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? I have not, no. All right, this is real. It's on Wikipedia. I'm going to show you right now. Oh, because if it's Kruger on Wikipedia, effect. it must be real. <laughs> exactly. Oh. No, this is an actual psychological effect. It's a cognitive bias in which unskilled people make poor decisions and reach erroneous conclusions, but their incompetence denies them the cognitive ability to recognize their mistakes. So unskilled people suffer from illusory superiority. However, the opposite of true is for people who are very good in their field. They underestimate their own abilities because they, ha they, are, they have enough knowledge to judge their own mistakes. So people who are better at a given task will underrepresent their own ability. They'll underguess how well they're doing. And people who are very bad at something will always overestimate their ability. So these people are going around bragging, I'm going to be the best Guild Wars 2 player because I own in WoW, are probably of the first category and not the second. Backed up by science right here on the Tales of Tyrion. <laughs> I think that's the, I think that was the Webster Dictionary definition to a noob. So, I, I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that was perfect. <laughs> See, there's a noob and then there's a noob, you know, and we yes, all know you. the difference between, yeah, we all know the difference between those two, so. Yeah. <laughs> So I've got one more here before we close it out. We've got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to say it. Dynamic events are a gimmick, and they're going to fail as soon as everybody hits max level and they're done with their alts. Because, I mean, look at what happened to Warhammer Online. They had the same concept with their public quests, but it was worthless and stupid and felt retarded when you had nobody else leveling with you. And they had how many starting zones? They had six. Guild Wars is going to have Guild Wars 2 is going to have 5. It's going to be the same problem. Once you get that first initial rush of players, it's going to be awesome when everybody else is there playing with you and you can see everybody. And then once they're gone and at level 80, you're going to probably have another rush of people playing their alts and things like that. But after about a year, right before the next expansion comes out, nobody's going to be leveling new characters and somebody new coming to the game is going to go, "Wow, hello. Is there any other heroes out here? They're at centaurs attacking the all right, I'll just take care of this myself then, and you'll wander through an empty world, and then, by the time you get to an elite event, you've done all of this stuff to push back the centaurs, and now you have to fight the centaur general and his bodyguards, and it requires ten people, and you're sitting there going, Hello! It's eight o'clock Eastern time! Where are you guys? It's just not gonna work. <laughs> We're all gonna uh, be like, we're in world versus world. Where are you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's another thing because you can level up in world versus world, and you can do it from level five or whatever. That the, then nobody's going to be playing the things. The same thing that that Warhammer Online had. The PVE is going to be deserted. You know, there's only one fix to that, Bridger, and that's if they really go through with the concept that if I don't do that quest, it's going to have you know an, an issue, or it might affect me as a, as a player. That's it. They have to make some real, and I'm not talking, you know. Oh, I can't buy apples now because I didn't save the, the you know. The, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking something that says the price of me going to this keep, the 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 instant travel price or whatever you want to call it. It has to have a real impact. Let's say the cost goes up 25 percent. Oh my God, 
you know, then it's like, well, that pr that price adds up over time, and then it's like, well, guys, maybe we really should have went over there and saved that town or that village. But unless they do something like that, yeah, yeah I am in agreement with you. We lost Aku and it screwed up the video stream. I, I am apologize. on two parts of the you screen. Are. You could be <laughs> half face <laughs> one on each side. So uh, I could try and fix this if you don't give them back. But uh, let's let's continue on as if nothing happened. <laughs> For those of you listening to the audio portion, we, nothing has gone wrong. So, any any other thoughts about uh, about the the, the uh, dynamic event system being a gimmick that will only make the game worse? I think it's going to make the game great. I think that's the best part of the game. That that's why I'm going to play it. Just like they took an idea that was supposed to be sort of something additional for Warhammer Online, and they made it something so central to this game. And I think that's why Guild Wars 2, it's, it's, it's not going to be gimmicky because that's going to be it. There's no quests. It's dynamic events. There's no like, oh, I got to go to the raid now. No, it's dynamic events. And I think just because it's not an accessory and it's going to be the mainstay, that is going to make it successful. Um, one of the guys on our stream, very, very good point. Thanks, Nick, uh, for bringing this up, is in regards to... Uh, World versus World, there's another area that will take a lot of, um, uh, we'll say, attention from players uh, for quite some time if they do it right. And that is, he says, elite and game events in the end game areas like Ore are supposed to be like open world raids that will take multiple days to complete and require some level of communication. Basically, what he's getting at is uh, elite... Uh, encounters, bosses, etc. I still think, Nick, uh, that it's going to fall into once somebody does it, they will start refining that process and then other people will jump on that bandwagon saying, okay, here's the guide, guys. Let's all match this guide. And they all do it the same way and it still falls into that same trap. Though it will take some time and then there will be ways that other guilds do it and certain guilds will be looking to do it faster than others. I still think it falls into that trap that it's still static. Um, it will never match world versus world or PvP in general. I think there's also like those mini games in the cities too. Now that I think about it, they oh those. yeah, because what I really want to do when I get to level eighty, well, I beat all the dragons. I'm gonna go play a bar brawl. <laughs> I'm gonna go play with the high the guys. I'm gonna get the like high score in the archery game. It's like an arcade machine. You just go in. You got to get that top spot in the high score, so everyone who walks through the capital city can see it. You know how awesome you are. <laughs> like I don't think they're gonna have like, oh, this is our high end, you know, mini games, you know, <laughs> city. You know, this is where we're gonna have the game. high end games. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it's gonna. I think it's gonna. They're like, it looks. I don't know what to say with that. I think that's more just a city thing. Like they just want to make cities more alive, but that has nothing to do with the point that we were just talking about. <laughs> and see, they can make the mini games like the bar brawls uh, so hard. It'll be like metaphorically similar to Skyrim, where <laughs> oh, I kill I kill twenty dragons, but I'm sure as heck not gonna mess with that giant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, giants! Oh, they 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 play they play golf, and their club is a par four. <laughs> I think we're looking at PVE from a too much of a MMO perspective, traditional MMO perspective, fairly <laughs> story driven. Sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, they talk about there's a single player MMO cleverly hidden, and with the sidekicking system, like a lot of people in the chat were talking about this, about the scaling of events and about the sidekicking system, and it makes it so that more like a single player RPG, you go through every zone and you try to experience all the content, even stuff that you missed. Like the level thing is kind of irrelevant because you can always go back. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it where it's less, it's more of a linear, well, it's an open experience, it's emergent gameplay, but you just go through to the end of all the content and then you can quit or come back as much as you want without having to worry about, oh, I only want to play a little bit, but I have to pay $15 a month. So I guess I won't. You can just play it at your own pace. And then when the new expansion comes out, you know, you can get heavy into it like an MMO. But I think they're allowing people to go casual if they want to. I don't know if there's going to be a hardcore PvE thing. I think that's something that might grow. I'm thinking the hardcore PvE element is probably going to be fledgling in the beginning. And that's what will grow. Whereas in most games, it's usually the PvP that's small and grows. As far as MMO are concerned, I think it might be reversed in this case. 
that their content just gets better and better with each expansion. You bring up that good point, Giga, about the personal story. Like, that's not something they flaunt around all the time on, like, one other game that's going to be coming out by the end of this year that is like, this is our game, you know? Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah, I was going to say, cough, cough, uh, Star Wars. A lot of people that talk to me about Star Wars, and I do have a lot of friends and guildies that are playing Star Wars, so don't get me wrong, but their biggest argument about why the game's going to be successful is you can play it like a single-player MMO. Well, gosh, golly, I could play Mass Effect 3 like a single-player MMO. <laughs> but how many, pe- well, how many people are still playing that game? Sure, I could play casual. I could play at my own pace. I could even restart a character and play as an evil and a, you know, a sadistic character that steps on kittens. But it's still, I play through it once or twice, three times. It's the same thing over and over and over. And yes, it will cater to the casual players, just like Mass Effect. You could do the same thing. Uh, Dragon Age, we've all played these games where you play a single-player MMO. But who is still playing these games? Nobody. And uh, once you play through it once or twice and you have that open-ended, multiple-path, multiple-choice feeling, it's gone. So where does that lead people? You know, that leads them to the world versus world and stuff. So exactly. that's my little rant. <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> I think we're going to wrap it up here. But what we are going to do is ask you guys to stay tuned for Skyrim chat. So we're going we're gonna to wrap up the official show, but we've all been endor- en- engrossed in the game and we want to talk about it, and we figure you guys want to hear us talk about it because it's awesome. So if you want to stick around after the show, uh, we'll also tag this on at the end of the audio show if you'd like. So we're going to wrap this up right now. Let me first uh, start by saying uh, we'd love to hear your questions and comments and feedback on the show. Uh, so give us any, any of that at feedback at talesoftyria.com. Again, that's feedback at talesoftyria.com. Link will be in the show notes. It'll be everywhere. Uh, so <clears throat> do that. Also, I want to point out, if you haven't been to the Tales of Tyria website in a while, I had an article that I posted on there, the deconstruction of the never-ending MMO a while back. So if you think this is just a YouTube channel video thing that you watch every once in a while, check that out. It's a great article on talesoftyria.com. In addition, we've got a new feature on the left-hand side of that, and it is a donation button. And uh, this is not a requirement. It's not like we're going to stop broadcasting if we don't get enough money. Uh, but if you guys would like to give back, because we do donate a lot of our time to getting, uh, getting this show out there. And if you'd like to give back and help us pay for the website hosting and the, uh, the new cameras that we all had to buy in order to make this show really work, because I don't <laughs> use it for anything else. Uh, if you guys I would like to help, uh, what we, what we here at the show recommend is a, is about a you know a dollar a show. If, if a buck a show is all we ask. If you can afford it, that's great. Send it to us. If you can't, no no questions asked. The show is always going to be free. We're never going to ask you uh, for any money in order to watch the show or see the show. But that's there for people because there have been people that have requested to, some way to give back to us for for all the free content that we're giving to you guys. And so I thought I'd. Go through the motions and provide it for you. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. Pretty sure. We, we promise are... we're not buying the godly gigawatt symbol a microphone or a webcam. He'll <laughs> 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 no, never get it. The one that you tomorrow. can't leave it out. I'm getting it tomorrow. Yeah, all my new gear. And I'm I'll just believe gonna... it when I see it. Screenshots or didn't happen. I guess so. <laughs> well, I'll just... Uh... Yeah, me and Aku are going to stream some League of Legends tomorrow night around 6, I think is when I'll... Or, or oh. earlier, if I'm going to set up earlier. But I'm uh, definitely right. starting by then. Well, we'll have to uh, see so that. So if anybody wants to tune into that, I'll throw the link. All right, stay tuned for some Skyrim, ladies and gentlemen, for the show about Guild Wars 2 is over. Bridger signing off. Have a good night. You know, one of these days we're gonna end it. Time. I'm in the middle of 
fading up the music and it's going out and we're slowly you know what I thought of that show and I just have to mute the mic as fast as possible damn it all I keep forgetting to mute you you always do that I say goodbye and you're like show must be over <laughs> oh come on you can record that music part anytime uh i gotta sync it up now oh uh, yeah i could oh All poor right. you poor me <clears throat> <laughs> it might interrupt your skyrim time it might interrupt my skyrim time that's exactly right you don't even work i have to go to work tomorrow damn it <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what it's like after work when skyrim's at home <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Whatever you were saying before. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I'm, I'm gonna shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is your this is your moment. We're, the show's over. You can talk. Uh, uh, you, you guys notice how Bridger gives me my mo moment at the end of the yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. I said, Do you have any news? Nobody said anything. I said, all right. I think that's it. Anybody say anything? Nope. Nobody said nothing. I gave you three milliseconds, and nobody jumped in. So I think that was fair. <laughs> well, because my rant's a personal rant. Well, so was yours, though. You seem to have a huge issue against people without RSS. Oh, no, I jacked that stuff up <laughs> as a rant for the show. I mean, I mean, it was it was frustrating, but it wasn't that frustrating. But I like to take frustrating things and make them comical. But we can uh, we can give you your own, but I, we got to get you a nice background track for it. It would be good. I got to nah. be prepared. If you have a rant, if anybody has a rant and they want to do that, we can get it going. It can happen. Just let me know ahead of time. We'll, we'll get it organized. We'll put it in the show notes and everything. It'll be official. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Just blasting this music. What do you listen to? Oh, I just booted up Skyrim, so. Oh, you oh. sure? <laughs> <laughs> How about the Chainsaw Monitor over now? Oh, we got to talk about it. Have you guys, I got to say, the best story that I've seen on Reddit was this story where somebody was talking about Lydia, like the best Lydia moments. So people were talking about Lydia, and somebody said, all right, <clears throat> so I was fighting this dragon with Lydia, and we did sort of an epic fight, and we finally got the dragon down, and suddenly I hear Lydia shooting her bow after the dragon is dead and absorbing its soul, and then I realized during the fight we wandered into a giant's lair, and now she's fighting the giant. And I thought to myself, oh, crap, and sure enough, he comes over with his, with his driver and just shoots Lydia out of the park. <laughs> and I screamed out, Lydia, no! And I went to town on this giant. I put in every single magic potion I have. I used all my magic. I used all my stamina. I used every potion. Need stamina back. Need magic healing. Go, go, go. And it wasn't enough. The guy was down to, like, 4% health. But he was about to go through another swing animation, and I didn't have any stamina left. I didn't have any magic left. My health was done. It was game over. When all of a sudden, an arrow comes and staggers the giant just before he hits me and allows me to get in two more swings with my sword and down him. And there's Lydia behind me, somehow survived her thousand-foot driving range. And then... <laughs> At the end of this, it says, the moral of the story, there is no moral. The cops came out, came because I was yelling at 4 a.m. in the morning trying to find out why. One of them looked in my room and saw, oh, he's just playing Skyrim and left. <laughs> <laughs> it's another one of those calls. Oh, that was my favorite story I've seen out of all of them. It's That's great. Hilarious. That's pretty good. Oh, oh, man, but anybody else have anything, uh, I mean, I I've been continuously surprised by this game, I have to say. I, 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 I think because of the fact that, um, I don't even know, this game's amazing, I, I can't even put it into words, it's just, I think one of the greatest things that, that I, I've noticed from this game was the fact that, um, I was actually kind of surprised because I actually thought the dragon thing was actually going to be very scripted. I had no idea like there were going to be random dragons. Like, I'm sorry, but the town of Riverwood, you guys, what, what, I don't, you guys need to put some money into defenses because <laughs> that 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 town's been attacked by four dragons. Literally, you can't walk without like literally that that main stretch, <laughs> dragon bones everywhere. I'm just like, what are you guys I, doing? 
I've gone into his room and, like, watched him play for a couple of seconds, and then he'll walk outside of, like, the inn, and then all of a sudden, like, the guard's running by, and I'm like, what what, what the hell's going on? You know, what, what is going on? And then all of a sudden, you hear the dragon cry, like, Rrr! and he comes swooping in. I'm like, wow, really? How come you always have the random dragon events in, like, the craziest places? I have to say, though. Yeah, so... Go ahead. This this very funny part happened. I I, I killed uh this this elf. I think his name is Fade Fade Fandall in in Riverwood. Oh, I, just I hate that guy. Yeah, so I killed him. So <laughs> I'm putting. I just killed. I just like saved Riverwood from a dragon, right? I, I collected everything, going back, putting my stuff in that chest, right? I'm loading back out, and what happens? Another dragon appears. I'm like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> They've got special <laughs> dragon pheromones spewed over the street or something. <laughs> Dragons aren't even the worst thing. You know, I, I make it a point to kill every bard I come across. What? <laughs> every like, bard? Even the guy who wanders every bard. Every bard has to die. I don't care. They start singing, they get an arrow to their head. <laughs> Doesn't matter if there's a bounty. <laughs> kill all witnesses. Then there's no innkeeper anymore. Solitude. I have like a 20,000 bounty in solitude because the whole entire bard's college is dead. Oh, man. <laughs> You go inside the Bard's College, there's dead bodies everywhere, and I just can't stand them. Because you killed they... all the Bards, and then you had to fight your way out <laughs> past the guards? Pretty much, yeah. I like how <laughs> people clearly aren't worth that many gold, that many septums. <laughs> what do you get, like a thousand septums? <laughs> Fine. Like, okay, <laughs> you find me for one-fifth of my house for killing somebody. <laughs> oh, man. I had an awesome moment where, <clears throat> you know how the dragons will sometimes do that crash down onto the ground, the crash landing when they do oh, too yeah. much damage? There's just one part where I was fighting in a castle that I had to clear, that I had cleared out for the Imperial Army. Uh, I remember what the hell it was called. Fort Riven something, whatever. It was up in the north. Anyway, I cleared out this fort and I came over to check on the soldiers and a dragon shows up. So we're all shooting at it. We're all shooting at it. I'm sort of right at the gate, this open gate in the walls and I'm shooting at it I'm shooting at it and suddenly enough arrows hit it and he kind of does this diving swoop and crashes to the ground and I'm like oh shit cause he's heading right for me and I like, duck back through the gate and he sort of gets wedged into the gate as he crash lands and I'm able to just warhammer him in the head cause he can't go anywhere <laughs> that was just the best moment ever some of those crazy moments where just the random physics of it all coincides to make an epic sort of movie like scene have you guys ever had a guard come up to you and tell you, let me guess, somebody stole your sweet roll? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had that? Yeah, those guards die too. <laughs> My favorite is the one where uh, I used to be an adventurer like you, but then I took an arrow in the knee. I'm like, then how are you a guard? Don't you need to run around and stuff like that? You still need to fight. What's, what's better is there's so many guards that took an arrow to the knee. What that means is there's some <laughs> maniac out there who's shooting, shooting adventurers knees. in the knee. I make sure to wear my boots all the way up to the knee every time. Because, shit, that guy's out there somewhere. You never know. One thing I hate is when you're having a very, very important conversation with someone, like a contact or whatever, and there's some random guy who's like, oh, yeah, I won most of my fortune because I was a sailor back in the day. I'm like, great, I just missed something important. <laughs> Crap. They were telling me how to defeat the dragon, and you'd walk in here with your sailor story. Yep, and then I kill him. So it's, oh, it's all fine. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about a quest or something. And he's like, they call me Captain because I used to be a sailor. <laughs> I remember I'm like, that guy. Who are you? <laughs> I remember that guy. <laughs> oh, that guy's awesome. I have to say, there was one. Uh, it actually happened to me twice, and I can't remember. They might have been different characters, and maybe that's why it happened twice. But you ever you got that one where the fugitive comes up to you and says, "Hold on to this. Don't sell it." Don't don't uh, don't tell anybody, or I'll kill you. And he disappears into the wilderness. So that happened on my first character, and I kept it. And then somebody came by and said, "You see somebody go by here?" I said, "Were you looking for this helmet?" And they're like, "Yes, I was." So I did that the first time. The second time, I was like, "I want to follow this guy and see where he goes." So I just I followed him. I followed him. I followed him. And then the hunter of him kind of walks up to me and goes, "Did you see which way that guy went?" And I was like, "Yeah." I was right behind him. You just walked past him and go that way. <laughs> you guys ever been in River Run when the dragon attacks? And I guess it happens all over the place. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, dragon's killing everybody, guards dying everywhere. And this courier runs up to you and says, I have a letter for you. 
<laughs> and he's half naked. Why I'm in the middle of naked? casting like a double, you know, a double hand lightning bolt, and he interrupts and says, "I have a letter for you." <laughs> It's just, it's awesome. And then he just casually goes on his way, and the dragon's just mauling everybody around you. It's great. When Angie started playing, she started playing because she saw that there was horses, and her, the dragon, the first dragon that you fight, started eating her horse, and she's like, oh, no, you didn't! <laughs> That's my horse! Spit him out! And she goes wailing on him with her magic. <laughs> when you when you throw magic, it does this, actually. And <laughs> That's how I learned. It was actually pretty funny. Uh... Great. He kind of came into my room crying, just like he was just like, "Oh my God, I can't believe this happened." I'm like, "What?" You know, I thought something epic. He's like, three ice bears just killed my horse. I'm so <laughs> pissed right now." <laughs> I have to say, one of the best pieces of oh, we lost great. One of the best pieces, <clears throat> the best pieces of uh, posts on Reddit I've seen was somebody came on there and said, "You know, I noticed there's a problem." with Skyrim. Uh, people seem to be losing their horses an awful lot. <clears throat> if there was some piece of armor that we could maybe equip with our horse, <laughs> I would be willing to pay for that. <laughs> oh, man. That was great. It was great parody. Did anybody else get that? I think that's hilarious. I thought it was hilarious, too. Uh, I just can't believe, though, I have to say, did anybody else do the uh, Stormcloak or Imperial uh, storylines at all? I, I actually alert. haven't. Uh, I actually haven't picked a side yet. <laughs> oh. I've just been doing my Dark Brotherhood and Thieves Guild. I've just been so caught up with that. Oh, the Dark Brotherhood! You know it's great. My, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna do a, a badass. You know, I don't care about nothing character later. But <clears throat> I got to the Dark Brotherhood thing. And spoilers for people that 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 don't want to turn it off because we're talking about the game. Um, I got to the Dark Brotherhood thing where I, I actually wound up killing uh, that that kid's orphan orphan leader because she was a bitch she, i was yeah, not was. going to kill her <laughs> just on his say so but when i walked over there and she treated those kids like crap i'm like oh you're getting an arrow in the head so oh, you're dying you and i tried to do, do something uh, next time you load up skyrim do this just because it's screenshot worthy and you'll think it's the coolest thing ever go to the mountain called throat of the world you guys know where that is right it's mm. where the the high hrothgar are okay go to the very tallest peak it's the highest point in the game and you're gonna find a pickaxe called notch's pickaxe it's awesome. It's, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna carry go that there. one around in mind with that. Oh, it's just called Notched Pickaxe. Notched. Well, it's a reference to Minecraft. Right. It's it's, it's yeah. awesome. It's like you don't even expect to find it there. But I was like, I wonder what happens if I go to the very top. If there'd be like a special chest or something. No, I find a pickaxe that's referencing to Minecraft. I still have that pickaxe at the main table in my house. It's awesome. Oh man, I need to get that and carry that one around because I'm carrying a pickaxe around, but it's ten freaking pounds. Damn it. I hate that shit. Oh, but I was trying to get to it before. Anyway, spoiler to your muffs back on. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you in chat when it's over. But 